thought we'd start this video by quickly running down the games I identified as the best of the year for each of the last five years and see how they're holding up. So in 2016, I championed Via Nebula. It's a solid, simple and very pretty Euro game from Martin Wallace, and it holds up well. But at that point, I was actively avoiding Scythe. I was turned off by the mechs and my perception of the game as a dudes on the map sort of affair, which was likely to be full of direct confrontation. But I was wrong. Scythe is actually a wonderful game with conflict only forming a tiny part of the overall experience. If I was to redo the list, I think Scythe might trouble Via Nebula for top spot. In 2017, I hailed Untold Adventures Await as my game of the year. It's an amazing storytelling experience. I don't regret including it. But Bunny Kingdom was released in 2017. I just hadn't played it. And Bunny Kingdom would undoubtedly top the list if I was to revisit that year. In 2018, I chose Quacks of Quedlinburg, and I'd do the same again. Quacks is definitely one of the strongest titles I've come across in recent years. In 2019, Wingspan was my pick. It was a good choice. The commercial success of that game has been astonishing, so I'm really comfortable with that selection. And my 2020 game of the year was Isle of Cats. And no regrets there, it's a wonderful polyomino game which my wife and I just keep coming back to. So in this video, we're going to find out whether 2021 holds up as a good year, a great year, or a bit of a dud. Spoiler alert, it's terrific. I'm Adam Porter, I design games and I review them too. In 2021, I put out more videos on my channel than any other year since I started back in 2013. For the first time, I've been averaging one video a week, which has always been my goal. So if you're interested in designing games, there are a ton of videos on all aspects of game design and the board game industry. And when you're finished watching this video, check back through the channel and pick out a few others. I don't think you'll be disappointed. So on to my top 10 of the year, and the usual provisos apply. This is my personal 10 favourite games I've played this year. It's not intended as an authoritative list of the best games. As always, I've barely scratched the surface of all the releases and there are going to be many, many, probably hundreds of brilliant games which I've missed. But each of these is a game that I can wholeheartedly recommend. There are also a couple of 2020 titles which have crept onto the list. I always allow a little bit of leeway for titles which I inevitably missed during the previous year, often because they hadn't made it into wide distribution within the UK. In Abandon All Artichokes, each player is building a deck of cards with a mix of vegetables in them. But the goal of the game is to get rid of all of your artichokes. Each player starts with a deck which simply contains 10 artichokes. You start the game with 5 of these in your hand. And on your turn, you take a vegetable card from the central display and then play any number of cards from your hand. You then place all played and unplayed cards onto your own discard pile and draw a new hand of cards. If the deck's empty, you shuffle your discard pile to make a new deck. And most of the vegetable cards, when played, allow you to rid your deck of artichokes in one way or another. For example, broccoli allows you to get rid of an artichoke if you have three or more artichokes in your hand. Carrots allow you to get rid of exactly two artichokes, but you can't do anything else on your turn. Onions get rid of one artichoke, but then the card is passed to the other player. And if when you refill your hand, you have no artichokes in it, then you win the game. So regular viewers of my channel know that I tend towards the lighter end of the board game world. I favour simple mechanisms, games which are easy to teach and play with gorgeous aesthetics. GameWrite is a great publisher for this sort of stuff. They have just such a great business model. If there's a big popular mechanism in the hobby sphere, the chances are that GameWrite have made an absolute bare bones introductory version of it. So if you found Pandemic too complicated, try Game Rights Forbidden Island. If Seven Wonders was a bit too much for you, then Game Rights Sushi Go might work. Is Splendor a bit too taxing for your family? Well, try Game Rights Happy City. And in this case, if you want to introduce your family to a bit of deck building, Dominion style, well, Abandon All Artichokes is the perfect stepping stone. It's a short game in a portable package with tons of personality. And as you'd expect with this sort of thing, there's not a ton of strategy involved. But you won't even notice. You don't play stuff like this to show off your deck building prowess. 
You play it to get all the fun of the random card draws, the speculative purchases, and the take that moments, all in a time frame short enough to keep your kids' interest or squeeze in between some meatier titles. In Llama Land, players are tasked with gathering cacao, corn and potatoes and feeding them to llamas who occupy your fields. On your turn, you either place a tile on top of your existing tiles or alongside them. If placed on top, you gain crops as shown on the tile. These can be used to attract point-scoring llamas who sit on your fields, blocking you from placing more tiles above. If you place over a village, you gain character cards which give you special abilities, allowing you to convert crops or generate additional crops when you place tiles. If you place next to your tiles, you can place a token onto one of the point scoring objective cards or move a token from one objective to another. At the end of the game, you'll score points for llamas that you've gained, crops that you've gathered and completed objectives such as having four llamas in the same row or four llamas each at a different height or two of each different type of llama card. At the start of the year, I made a series of videos covering my top 100 games of all time. The mechanism which featured most frequently was tile laying, with 14 examples of that genre in the list. And designer Phil Walker-Harding was my second most featured designer, only beaten by the prodigious Rainer Knizia. So Llama Land is another tile laying game by Walker-Harding, so it was always going to catch my attention. Now this one has a feel of Baron Park about it. You place polyominoes, and when you cover icons, you get stuff. There's a race to gather the highest scoring cards, so it's familiar territory here. But the stacking of tiles does add a fresh feeling to the game, and as a result, Llama Land is a little bit more challenging with a little bit more depth. If you played Baron Park with the Bad News Bears expansion, we're probably in a similar level of complexity here. Personally, I find the massive display of cards in Llama Land a little bit messy and a little bit distracting. So it doesn't quite reach the heights of Walker Harding's Baron Park for me, but it is still an excellent game and it's well worth your time. In Brew, players are villagers in a woodland realm full of magical creatures, where all the seasons happen at the same time, and you're tasked with brewing magical potions to bring normality back to this woodland realm. Throughout the game you place dice onto matching symbols, either in the forest or in the village. And when you place in the forest it allows you to forage for ingredients, or to train a creature. And trained creatures give you permanent abilities. And when you've gathered enough ingredients you can brew a potion, which gives you a one-off ability that you can use later in the game. When you place at the village, then you take an associated action, and the available actions change between rounds as the day turns into night. And at the end of each round, you then claim a forest if you had more dice on it than any other player, and after four rounds the game ends, and you score points for claimed forests, for trained creatures with a bonus if they're released into a matching coloured forest, potions that you've brewed, and for leftover ingredients. I first saw photographs of Brew on Instagram, and I was immediately drawn in by that fantastic artwork and the beautiful dice. To be honest, the theme of the game doesn't make any sense at all when playing, but it's a nice world to occupy nonetheless because of the gorgeous appearance of the game. So Brew features a lot of direct interaction between players, and that's going to put some people off. Your plans are going to be ruined frequently by your opponents, manipulating your dice and blocking spaces to take control of forest cards which you thought you had in the bag. But you know what? You're going to be doing it to them too, so it didn't really bother me. I don't mind confrontation like this if it's a core part of the game. It isn't tacked on, it's not an occasional occurrence, it's up front and centre. It's just part of the challenge. And if you're concerned about dice in a strategy game, you don't need to worry too much. The dice in Brew are rarely rolled, so it's not a totally random affair. But if you love chaotic, quick-playing dice games, well this one might not be for you. The overall package though, it's really affordable, which I appreciate. The tokens are cardboard and the dice, they're not the weightiest, but they're very functional, and the artwork and the price point more than makes up for any shortcomings. I've really enjoyed it. In Enchanted Plumes from designer Brendan Hansen and Calliope Games, you're building peacocks. I'd like to say there's more to the story than this, but there isn't. It's a very simple card game. Players start with a hand of peacock feathers, and on your turn you can play one or two of them. And then you either draw two new cards, or you swap cards with the central display. 
I really like this mechanism. It means that your hand size keeps changing throughout the game. When you play a card, you place it into a row, which will gradually build up to become a peacock. You can build loads of small peacocks, or you can focus on a small number of massive ones. The top row of each peacock will score negative points equal to the value of the cards up there. So you want low numbers at the top. Once you move on to a lower row, you're going to be scoring positive points for each card placed. So this is where the higher numbers go. But there's a catch. You can only place a colour in a row if it's already present in the row above. Now there are lots of opportunities for card counting in this game and you don't want to be halfway through constructing a lower row only to find out that there are no more cards of the colour that you wanted left in the deck and you're not going to be able to complete that peacock. But another brilliant design choice has the player place their final card on each peacock face down, which means that there isn't perfect information in the game, so card counting can't be relied upon. But even more importantly, it just looks awesome. Completed peacocks score one bonus point per card, and when the peahen card is drawn from near the bottom of the deck, the game ends and the highest scorer wins. I was attracted to Enchanted Plumes because I myself designed a game about peacocks a few years ago. You may have heard me mention it. I feel quite attached to them. I want to make sure that other designers are treating peacocks with the respect they deserve. And it turns out I needn't have worried because Enchanted Plumes is great. I really liked the central concepts in this game. The limitation of only playing cards which match colours in the row immediately above makes for some really neat choices. And I like the drafting of the cards too. It could easily have gone down the ticket to ride route here where you either draw a card from the display or take one blind from the deck. But instead, in Enchanted Plumes, you either take a card blind or you swap one from your hand with the display, which has the effect of reducing your hand size. And because you have the choice of playing either one or two cards on your turn, you get loads of control over your hand size throughout the game. It's a really unusual mechanism. I enjoy the trade-off of reducing my hand size to just a few cards in order to access the cards which I really want from the central display. The game does have a few problems. The visual display is stunning, but it takes up loads of space. And while lots of effort has gone into distinguishing colours for colourblind players by making the feathers slightly different shapes, they're still not really distinct enough to easily identify a colour across the table at a distance. And actually the font used for the numbers doesn't help much here either. There's also a hefty dose of luck involved in the game, so you can get shut out through no fault of your own. But that said, there are plenty of great decisions to be made, and it's not dissimilar to other small box card games in that regard. I think this one has flown under the radar a bit, but it's well worth checking out. In Grasshopper Poker, players are trying to gather sets of fruit and vegetables while avoiding greedy grasshoppers. Each player has eight cards, numbered one to six, with one ace and one special X card. Three cards are turned face up from the deck into the display, and matching cards are stacked to form a column. Every player secretly selects one of their numbered cards and reveals together. The highest card takes their choice of card or column from the display, and then the next highest number, and so on. And if you've played an ace, you take all the cards. If you played an X, you take nothing from the display unless someone else played an ace, in which case you take all of the cards instead. If two or more players play the same value, their cards are ignored and the players get nothing. If you've ever got three matching fruit or vegetables, you discard them immediately and you take one chip. But if you ever have three or more grasshoppers, they eat the entire garden and you lose all your cards. When players have used all eight of their numbered cards, the round ends, and the player with the most fruit and veg gains one chip. A new round is played, and this is repeated until all the cards in the deck have been used up. At this point, the player with the most chips wins the game. If you looked at the box, the artwork, the name, the designer Jacques Zymet, and the publisher, you're likely to be expecting a sequel to Cockroach Poker, a similar experience. And truthfully, this isn't that game. Cockroach Poker is one of my favourite games of all time, so I had to take a moment to come to terms with that realisation before I could appreciate Grasshopper Poker on its own terms. As always, I love the presentation of the game. I'm a collector of Dry Magia's Ugly Bugs range of games, so this was always going to be an instant buy for me. But it turned out to be one of the best in the range. I really think Jacques Zymet is one of the most overlooked designers among board game commentators. He's prolific, and all his games are super slick. 
Grasshopper Poker has just the right level of bluffing your opponents, a degree of card counting, and real highs and lows. It's devastating when those grasshoppers destroy all your veggies, but soon it will be followed by a big high when you pull in a massive yield on a later turn. The game's really simple to learn and teach, it plays really fast, and it's extremely rewarding. Highly recommended by me. In Undaunted North Africa, two players represent the Long Range Desert Group, a reconnaissance unit of the British Army, and the Royal Italian Army in 1940. Each scenario is described in a scenario book, which tells you which rules, objectives, and components to use. Each player has a deck of cards representing soldiers, and a number of tokens on the board indicating their location. And at the start of each round, both players draw four cards. They simultaneously choose one to use to determine their initiative, and the player who chose the highest card will take the first turn, but the chosen cards are discarded. The players then use their other cards to take various actions – moving, driving vehicles, scouting new areas, bolstering, which really means selecting new cards for your deck, drawing additional cards, or taking control of territories. At the end of the turn, players discard all used cards, but when their deck has run out, the discard pile is shuffled to become their new deck. Scouting is an essential action in this game because you can't move into a space unless it's been scouted, but doing so adds Fog of War cards to your deck, which don't do anything, so they seriously hamper your plans. Of course, attacking is a major part of the game, and this is done by using an attack action, and then rolling dice to see if the attack is successful. Your attack roll must equal or beat the opponent's defence value, and their defence is determined by the value printed on their token, plus the defence value of the tile they're on, and the number of tiles between the attacker and the defender. If an attack is successful, the target loses the corresponding card from their deck. And once the objectives of the scenario have been met, the winner is determined. This is really a placeholder for the undaunted system as a whole. This year I played Normandy and North Africa for the first time, and I love them both. I'm aware that Undaunted Reinforcements is being released right about now, but I haven't yet played that one. I tend to meet up with Trevor and David, the designers of Undaunted, at Essen Spiel and UK Games Expo each year, so I've followed their careers as they've developed, and it's wonderful to see them reaching such great heights with Undaunted and also War Chest, which is another really popular game of theirs. I really enjoy games which focus on personal stories, focusing in on an individual rather than a massive anonymous group. It's the reason I engage more with Flashpoint Fire Rescue rather than Pandemic. Saving individuals from a burning building is just more evocative to me than saving countries from a virus you can't see. Likewise, with Undaunted, I enjoy the lens of looking at military squads in a small-scale skirmish. Following the movements of a handful of soldiers, each drawn with unique art, and they've all got names on the cards. The theme really comes through, despite the strange abstraction of using deck building to control the action. It helps that I really enjoy deck building too. The game is beautifully presented as always with Osprey Games. I recently received a review copy of Pitch Out from Hachette Board Games UK, and it's a great little flicking game. In fact, it's one of the best I've played. It's simple, it's portable, it's tactical, and it's exciting. It reminded me of all the fun I've had over the years with Catacombs, Cube Quest, Flick 'em Up, and other flicking games. Your goal is to eliminate the opponent's captain, or to eliminate all of the player's other pieces so that only their captain remains. The assassin eliminates opposing players when it makes contact with them instead of needing to knock them off the table as usual. The runner can be flicked twice in a single turn, so long as it doesn't make contact with anyone on its first flick. The guard can be removed in place of another piece to prevent them from being eliminated. The immortal cannot be eliminated from the game by falling off the table edge on its own turn and the captain can utilise the power of any of your other playing pieces which have already been eliminated. The advanced game of Pitch Out allows players to select a variety of additional elite playing pieces with differing abilities. Pitch Out comes with plastic squares which form the barriers for the game, but double up as the storage for the discs that are used. This is one of those games where you could swear it exists already. It's such an obvious idea, so simple and intuitive. And frankly, flicking games have become a little bit bloated with the massive, sprawling scenario-based games Catacombs and Flick'em Up. 
Both games are magnificent. They're deep and immersive with a ton of creativity and ingenuity in their mechanisms, but they are complex and tough to set up and tear down, and they take up loads of time and space. Pitch Out, on the other hand, takes seconds to set up, a couple of minutes to teach, and you're off. It condenses much of the fun of those bigger titles into a much more manageable package. The game it most closely resembles is Cube Quest, the special powers, the small degree of army building, but Pitch Out is actually more intuitive than Cube Quest, with none of the awkwardness of rolling dice to determine results, etc. The powers are fun, and there's no need for a board. You can adapt to the size of your own table. The packaging doubles as terrain. It's just great. I recently made a video about flicking games and the mechanisms used in them, with loads of great examples. I'll put a link in the description below. But Pitch Out stands out as one of the best in the genre. In Cartographer's Heroes, players are creating maps by drawing polyomino shapes onto a grid. The player who discovers the most desirable lands, and hence gains the most victory points, wins the game. Each player has a blank sheet and a pencil, or in the collector's edition, a set of coloured pencils. Four cards are laid out on a table, representing special scoring opportunities. These can be mixed with the scoring cards from the original cartographer's game to massively increase the number of possible combinations. In this example, players are trying to build long columns of forest, or place water and farms next to mountains, or place villages in two by two squares, or fill in complete diagonal lines across their grid. Each turn, one card is revealed, indicating a terrain type and a shape, which players must draw onto their map. Usually, there's a choice to be made. If you completely surround mountains, you'll gain coins, which are worth points at the end of each round, representing a season. Monster cards allow you to draw a shape in the most awkward spot on one of your opponent's maps. In the Heroes version of Cartographers, these monsters have additional effects. The zombies increase in number at the end of each round, killing the dragon gives you lots of gold, the troll destroys terrain adjacent to it. At the end of each round, you'll lose points if you haven't fully surrounded all monsters on your map, but the heroes, referenced in the title of the game, arrive from time to time and allow you to destroy monsters if you can place the hero in a suitable position nearby. The round ends when a set total is reached by adding up the numbers at the top of each card, and the players then score points according to the criteria on two of the scoring cards. So in spring, the cards A and B score. In summer, it's cards B and C. In fall, cards C and D score. And in winter, it's D and A. After four seasons, the players total their victory points, and the highest scorer wins. Cartographer's Heroes was released along with three map packs, which can be purchased separately. These add fun new options for changing up the gameplay. So one has a volcano at the centre of the map, which spreads lava across the land throughout the game, destroying the shapes that you've drawn earlier. Another has you playing on separate small islands, which you can only access by spending coins to make connections. The third map requires you to place shapes adjacent to each other, so there's always a path tracing back to the gate. And finally, a selection of promo cards are available, which allow players to spend coins throughout the game in order to use special abilities. In 2019, Cartographers was my number two game of the year, just ousted from the top spot by Wingspan. In 2021, Thunderworks Games had another stab at it with Cartographers Heroes, and to be honest, on any other year, this could easily have topped the list. It's a top-tier game, one of the best to come out in recent years. This just hints at the quality that's to come, with numbers 1 and 2 on my list, of course. Cartographer's Heroes is a standalone game which can be combined with the original or played on its own. It's very similar, with a few key evolutions. Monsters with special effects, and the heroes that are referenced in the title. Perhaps even more exciting were the expansion map packs, which were released alongside this new game. These really do shake up the gameplay and make it feel fresh. Not that Cartographers was lacking in any way. Two years on from its initial release, I'm still just as enamoured with that base game as I was back then. And now I have this massive box full of stuff. Loads of different ways to play. And crucially, they all work really, really well. The only part of the various expansion materials which I haven't fully explored is the promo skill cards. Between the two released packs, there are a ton of special powers in there which can be used by spending coins. Now, personally, I found that these are a little bit too much when you've got so much else to focus on in the game. So when I've laid them out on the table, I've tended to find those optional powers get ignored. Players are happy to stick with their point-scoring coins. 
Cartographers has all the fun of polyomino tile laying games without the awkward setup and the hogging of table space. It can be played quickly, has a nice dose of interaction which is refreshing in the roll and write or flip and fill genre, and it's certainly my favourite implementation of the mechanism. Zombie Teens Evolution is a cooperative legacy game for children and families. You're a team of teenagers hiding out in a school in the middle of a zombie apocalypse, and you need to collect crates of ingredients from the four locations at the corners of the board and get them back to the school to win each game. But if the four corner locations get overrun with zombies, then you lose. And on your turn you can take two actions, move, attack, or transfer a crate. But you need to work together because you can't move with a crate, you can only ever pass it to a teammate on an adjacent space. At the start of each turn you roll a dice and this dictates how the zombies move, or instructs you to draw a card which activates some sort of event which is usually quite punishing. When you finish a game, win or lose, you place a sticker onto the progress track. And if you also completed any one of the included missions, you also place a mission sticker. When you place a sticker next to an envelope, you open the envelope and you add the components for your next game. This adds a new panel to the comic in the rulebook, new event cards, new rules, and new missions to attempt. And if you ever complete all of the missions in one section, you get an accomplishment. After achieving a few accomplishments, you also get to open envelopes, and so the game continues to evolve as you play. I played the entire legacy campaign of Zombie Teens Evolution solo, and I loved it. The central puzzle is so slight that it allows loads of scope to expand in all sorts of different surprising directions. And that's what you discover when you open up those envelopes. They're always exciting. They feature loads of fun new ways to play. Now playing solo has a similar feel to a logic puzzle, like the games that I really enjoy from Smart Games or Happy Puzzle Company. Each challenge took me about 10 to 15 minutes to complete, and then I was on to the next one, usually with some clever, unexpected twist. The story's strong too. When you open an envelope, it doesn't just feature new rules, but also a new panel for the comic strip in the rulebook, and there are some genuinely surprising and engaging twists to the tale. One real highlight of that package is that the game is totally replayable, even after completion of the campaign. There's nothing that's been destroyed or even altered. So you can reset back to the basic rules, or you can mix and match your favourite modules and missions to recreate exactly the difficulty and experience that you're looking for. I've recommended this game to everybody I know that's got kids. But frankly, even if you're an adult and you fancy a breezy, light, solo puzzle to work through, it might be a good choice for you too. And so that brings us on to number one on my list, and this game is not my standard fare at all. It's probably the heaviest game I have in my entire board game collection. Well that's if you don't count its precursor. So if you follow this channel regularly, you'll know that my favourite game is North Star Games Evolution. And a big factor in that is that I love the theme of the game. Simulating, controlling and developing an ecosystem is just totally engaging for me. I love games based around nature. So my number one game of 2021 is Dominant Species Marine. In Dominant Species Marine, each player controls an animal class, so crustaceans, reptiles, fishes or cephalopods. And throughout the game, they place cubes representing different species onto the board to populate the world and dominate various elements. The sun, worms, plankton, gastropods, sponges and algae. The game is driven by a worker placement board where you place pawns to take actions. And when you place a pawn, you get the benefit of the action immediately, placing new tiles onto the board, moving species, making elements available in certain locations, or perhaps adapting your animal so that it can thrive in different environments. When you place a pawn, nobody else can use the spot that you've blocked, unless a player uses a special white pawn which bumps the other player off the space and returns their pawn to them. You also can only play on spaces lower on the board than other pawns that you've already placed. But again, white pawns break this rule and can be placed anywhere. Better still, they give you upgraded versions of the actions. As you can probably tell, the white pawns are really desirable. But in order to gain control of a white pawn, you have to be dominating a certain element. This means having that element on your animal board and occupying lots of tiles with that element on the earth. 
It's a cutthroat game with actions which remove opponents' cubes from the board or elements from their tiles. Instead of placing a pawn, you can retrieve all of your pawns from the board in a single turn. And scoring happens at various points, but most frequently it happens when players take an evolution action. And they pick a tile and they score if they have the most cubes there. There are sometimes also points for second and third place as well. And when you take this action, you also get to use an evolution card from the display, which have really powerful effects, usually to the detriment of the other players. When a new card is revealed, it might bring about an extinction event, where species die if they're on a tile which they haven't adapted to. Or a survival event might occur, where the player occupying the most vents gets lots of points. The game ends after the asteroid card is played, and players score all the tiles on the board, as well as scoring for occupying vents, and for controlling the special white pawns the highest scorer wins. The original Dominant Species has been a favourite of mine for many years. It's not one that I play often because of the complexity, the tricky rules teach, and the long duration. It tends to take about three or more hours to play, and the gameplay is really cutthroat, so I pick my players carefully. But I love it every single time. So I was excited when I saw that a sequel was on the way. The Marine version has a different engine at its core. Both games centre around a worker placement table, but in the original you're programming your actions in advance, lining them up one after the other, then executing all players' actions at a later point. And this left loads of scope for other players to cut in front of you, mess up your plans, manipulate one vital part of your programme so that all your later actions are rendered useless. In Dominant Species Marine, though, when you take an action, you immediately receive the reward, and this totally changes the dynamic of the game. It's a bit snappier, and there are some great new mechanisms incorporated to replace the dominance mechanism from the original game, which was always a little bit clunky and hard to understand for new players. The new system is hardly simple, all right? It it features players competing to control these special action pawns which give them access to upgraded spaces on the worker placement board. But it just feels fresh. It's nice playing something so familiar, but substantial enough changes in it to make the game feel genuinely new. I'm not sure that Marine is a, a better game than its predecessor, but it's certainly an equal, and I can see myself returning to both in the future depending on my mood. For me, this list of 2021 games has been the best of the last few years. In a different year, I could easily see the list being topped by Zombie Teens Evolution, Cartographer's Heroes, Pitch Out, or Undaunted. They're all worthy of a number one spot. I'd like to thank all my regular viewers for their support, comments, likes, and shares this year. After eight years, Adam in Wales is still a small channel, but thanks to you all, the channel has grown a lot this year. Only four months ago, I was thanking you all for helping me reach 3,000 subscribers, and we're now at 3,500. I hope to keep making videos just as frequently in 2022, and your comments are my fuel, so keep them coming. I'd love to hear about your favourite games of the year. Nodolik Flowen, have a wonderful Christmas and a happy new year.